Good morning. Welcome back. So today is almost exactly the midway point of the semester. I think I said that on Monday, um, but it's actually true today. So this is the midpoint week, this is the midpoint day, and so you guys are roughly 50% done with the class. So I'm gonna take this as an opportunity to talk a little bit about what happens next for the next two months, roughly. It's almost exactly two months until you'll be demoing your final project Android applications at our final project fair, which is gonna be awesome. So um, there's a lot, we still have a lot to talk about, there's a lot of cool things to do. You guys are still gonna learn a lot over the next half of the semester, uh, but it's kind of a fun point to, to take a step back and talk about where we've come and where we're going. So let me talk a little bit about content first. Let's talk about content, and then we'll talk a little bit about the assessments, um, because we're kind of at the 50 point, 50 percent point for both. So what we've been doing up till this point, and this is kind of one of the last couple lectures that we're gonna do, uh, entirely devoted to object-oriented programming, although we will introduce some new ideas in that space as we start to talk about other things, um, but that's what we've been doing up till this point. So the past, you know, two months, we've been focused on introducing you to object-oriented programming and imperative programming. Those are ideas that we'll have a chance to keep practicing. So as we start to talk about other things, we will be, we'll be designing classes together to implement data structures. And we'll be designing imperative code to implement algorithms, and we'll actually be introducing you to some new ideas that you can use to write your code in different ways. So what we start talking about next week, and we continue talking about for the balance of the semester, um, and these are super fun topics. In many ways, what we have in front of us is a lot more interesting and exciting, I think, than what uh, sort of we have behind us. What we have behind us is a lot of sort of skill building. What we have in front of us is some of the core conceptual material that defines computer science as a field. Algorithms, data structures. So those are two big topics that we will return to over and over again for the next two months. We're gonna talk about searching, sorting, um, various types of algorithms, trade-offs between different ways of doing those things. We're gonna talk about data structures like lists, trees, maps. Also talk about hashing, which is a really fun topic. Um, and then we're also gonna introduce you to some new ideas about how to write programs. What we've been talking about up till this point is a style of programming that's sometimes referred to as imperative where you are sort of ex telling the machine exactly what to do, using loops, using conditional expressions, all of these constructs that we've introduced you to already. But that's not the only way to program a computer. There are some other really interesting ways to solve problems using computers, and we'll t we're gonna definitely talk about one of them, which is called recursion. Recursion is this um, idea that I can break a problem down into smaller and smaller pieces until I've created a piece that's really easy to solve, and then I can reassemble the solutions to those various pieces together. And, you know, uh, replacing iterative code with a recursive solution can sometimes lead to um, a program that is much more elegant, much simpler. We may, I'm hoping that we get a chance to talk about this a little bit this semester, because this is something I think is really cool. It's not something that Java does extremely well, um, but we also may talk a little bit about what's called functional programming. Um, so thinking about functions as data, thinking about different ways to apply functions to problems in ways that allow us to uh, load even a new tool into our belt. Again, this is not Java's strong suit. A lot of languages from around that time don't do this particularly well, uh, but Java does have some, have some support for this, and I hope we'll be able to talk about it a little bit. Okay. Assessments. So where are we as far as the assessments in the class? One of the things I wanna remind you as you make decisions about your future in this course is that um, we're 50% done with the assessments. There is no magic, you know, I think sometimes, you know, you take classes where like there's a final that's worth 25% of your grade, or even more, maybe. And unfortunately, I think that sometimes leads to sort of magical thinking, right? Like somehow, I'm not doing very well in the class, but I'm gonna go in and take the final, I'm gonna have this day where I remember everything, uh, including things that I don't understand about the class, I'm gonna do really well in the final, and that's gonna save my grade. Um, 125 isn't structured that way, and it's not structured that way on purpose, because the way you learn this material is by consistent daily practice. 
That's why we've been doing daily homework. That's why we have you working on MPs pretty much from the day you start the class till the day you finish. That's why we have quizzes every week. That's why we have, and that's why this semester we decided to break up the midterm, the uh, previous final exam into these three pieces. So essentially, we're halfway done with the assessments. And what comes in front of us is very similar to what you've already done. So please don't think that somehow, you know, if you're, if you're really struggling at this point in the course, it's unlikely that things are going to change. Maybe something changed in your life that I don't know about. That's fine, right? That happens and, you know, that can produce a dramatic improvement in performance or a dramatic, you know, decline in performance. So I don't understand what's going on in your life. Um, so maybe that happened, but, you know, if, there, if you don't see a major change going on and you're really struggling to keep up, um, it's probably not going to get better. Um, so you might want to think about, you know, uh, dropping the class, given that the drop deadline is Friday. So what have we done up till this point? So we've essentially done three short MPs. Those were MPs zero through two. Those were one week. Um, we did a long MP, and we did a midterm. I'm not talking about the quizzes and the homework here, because those pretty much divide evenly front to back. So we're going to keep giving you daily homework problems. We're going to keep giving you weekly quizzes. Those are not going to change. There's a small change, though, in terms of how this works, because what we're going to do for the next half of the class, so uh, we started MP4 on Tuesday morning. That's a two-week MP, and then we're going to have a little bit of a break for the second midterm, and then you're going to work on another two-week MP. And then when we come back from Thanksgiving, that'll bring us up to Thanksgiving break, when we come back from Thanksgiving, you'll be doing a final project for the balance of the course. And I think you have about two, two and a half weeks to do that final project. Um, the final project cannot be dropped, but you don't want to drop the final project, because the grading is very generous. Um, so we had these two long Android MPs, and, and the stuff that we're doing for the balance of the semester is also all Android. Um, we have two more midterms. Obviously, the midterms can't be dropped either. So as far as the MPs go, you know, we've obviously moved into this new area where we're doing Android stuff. We have one non-droppable MP coming up, but it's a very generously graded MP. You're unlikely, if you do something for the final project, you're gonna do pretty well. It's very hard to get a zero unless you just don't do anything. Um, as far as the midterms, it's just one thing to keep in mind. We've done one, we have two in front of us, and that's a non-droppable part of the class. Jeremy. Are we gonna do any, um, like, class stuff about the Android and how to, like, set up, like, the app and just the Yeah, so we're probably not gonna do too much Android content in class. Um, we will talk about Android in lab. So we have a couple of upcoming labs where we're gonna introduce you to more Android ideas. So, you know, the, what we did this semester, actually, it's a good chance for me to talk about this a little bit. So we started MP4 on Tuesday. Um, it's an Android MP. And I suspect a lot of you are like, what is going on? And, you know, if you thought the code you were looking at before was confusing, the starter code we gave you, um, you know, your, your brain is probably exploding as you look at some of the stuff that we've given you for Android. So what we're doing this semester is we're trying to do this a little bit more slowly. Last semester we started with Android in the class, but we did it at the very end. And so what we're gonna do over the next couple MPs is we're gonna sort of let you get your feet wet with Android step by step, little by little, while you complete sort of the library part of the MP. So there are no points on this MP for anything related to the app. I hope that we, you, you will get the app to work, uh, because it's fun once it works. There's a little bit you have to do to get the app to work fully, but there's a lot of code there that you can use as a starting point. On MP5, which would be our next Android MP, we may ask you to do a little bit more work with the application. On the final project, it's up to you. You know, you have a blank slate. So our goal is, within a month, within the next couple MPs, and there'll be some labs in there as well, to bring you up to speed on Android to the point where you can build a small app for your final project. That is possible, trust me. Um, I can, actually, probably what I'll do later today is I'll post a link to the FAIR page from last semester, and you can see some of the final projects that students last semester did. And those were students that had, that will, that, that had had, by the time they got to that point, less exposure to Android than you will. So on some level, you know, the, there's a bifurcation at this point where the MPs were gonna be focusing on, you know, Android programming and having you give it a chance to build some real things. And then in class, we're gonna talk and be talking about these higher level concepts like algorithms and data structures. And I'm hoping that these two tracks are sort of highly complementary. So, you know, our, our class and our homework problems are, and the quizzes will be on this sort of loftier, more conceptual material. 
but on the MPs, we're giving you a chance to really get down in the trenches and hack and build some cool things. Um, because those are, those are, that's kind of what computer science is about. That's what makes it so much fun, right? You really have these deep conceptual ideas that are at the core of the field, but you also have the ability to do cool stuff. And the reason why we do Android is because it is by far the coolest thing you can do with Java. If we taught this course in another language, we would do something different. Because we're teaching it in Java, we're doing Android. Um, it's simply, again, the easiest way to build something real, to something that you can show to a friend, right? Something that you can actually deploy and get, you know, billions of people to use. Okay. Questions about this? Oh, I want to point something out. You guys are doing well, actually. Um, I hadn't looked at this for a while. Um, so without draps, the median grade in the course is about an 82, right? That was with the first, you know, nightmare midterm. Um, Average is about 79, so that's, that's probably pretty good. With drops, the median grade is a 94, right? So that's good. You keep this up, I will give out a lot of A grades in December, and I will be totally happy to do this. We're gonna post these scores later this week. We're gonna post information about where you are in the distribution. Um, one thing I wanna point out to just be careful about, We've applied, this is with all the drops that you have for the entire semester. So, you know, what might happen here is that you might, you might look like you're doing pretty good with the drops, but you've taken like six quizzes and you can drop three, so we've dropped half of them. You have six more quizzes that you need to take, roughly, and you can only still drop three, right? So, particularly if your score with drops is quite different than your score without drops, you just wanna be aware of that, right? Uh, because you know, you've kind of used up all of your dropped grades for the semester. If you get a couple of really bad scores, that, your, your score is gonna come, start to come down. Right, but, but I, was, I was pretty happy with this. I think this is good. Uh, people in the class are working hard, and that hard work is, is showing up, is paying off in, in, the, sco in the scores. Right, so, so we're gonna have, we're not gonna have midterm grades up on the official portal, but we will have um, a score for you and a, and a way for you to see yourself within the distribution of other students in the class. That's what I care about. Um, I, I don't wanna talk about letter grades at this point in the semester, but I want you to see, here's how the class is doing, here's how I'm doing, right? And we'll, we'll have that for each grade component. It's a good time to answer some questions. Oops, sorry. Um, right, so, and the reason we're doing this this week, obviously, is the drop deadline is coming up. Um, you know, I, I don't want you to continue in the class without knowledge of how you will probably end up doing in December. You know, I'd, I'd much ra rather have a larger number of people drop the class and not have to fail people. All right, so we're gonna put this information in front of you. It's up to you to make use of it. Again, there's, there's probably not, I, I just wanna warn you, if you're doing poorly, there's probably not some magic thing that's gonna happen between now and December that's going to, to change things for you. Okay. Finally, I wanna point something else out, which is that and nobody seems to have found or used this this semester, but if you have feedback that you wanna offer about the class, you can obviously post on the forum at any time and we can have a conversation about it there. Um, if you wanna post it anonymously, there's a form on the website Looks like this. This thing, you know, I had such high hopes for this thing. It's not, I'm not really living up to it. Um, so here's the anonymous feedback form that's on the website. You can use this to, you know, say anything you want. It's just an open box. There's no information about you that's recorded. When you submit it, I read these from time to time. Um, and, you know, if appropriate, I will respond on the forum. But we certainly look at all these posts and we think about what you say here. So if you have comments you wanna offer, I mean, obviously, I, I like it most when we can have a conversation about things on the forum, because I think that helps everybody get on the same page, but if that, you're not comfortable with that, uh, this is another way to talk back to us about how things are going. All right, questions at this point? Let me just sort of throw the floor open for anything, any concerns or questions that you might have at this sort of midway point. Yeah, Dr. Oh, good point. No, there's no extra credit that's been applied yet. 
So these scores are all also without extra credit. Good, good question. We, we, I'll probably at some point add that, but I, no promises on when. Yeah. So if you picked up a couple of the extra credit points that we've offered, uh, we may have a couple of other extra credit opportunities as well. There's definitely one extra credit opportunity, which is participating in the final project fair. If you do that, there's a percentage point in it for you. Yeah, in the back. Can we play capture the flag? I don't know. Do you guys want to play capture the flag? You mean like a real capture the flag? Like in the in the world, not online. Oh, an online one. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, fine. Yeah, if someone wants to set it up, we could also like play a real capture the flag in the universe, um, with like in a real flag and stuff. But yeah, I'm I'm down. I don't even know what I don't. I've set some of I, I've taught a course where we did one of those before, but I'm still not even quite sure what it is. Um, but yeah. Other questions? Okay, good. So, I want to review one of the homework problems. Time to time we do this. And, you know, I, I do watch discussions on the forum, and from time to time I feel like, now it's always interesting to me what you guys struggle with sometimes on, on these homework problems. And so, I want to look at this one, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about how to do it. So this was, I think, from a couple days ago. It asked you to create a class that had a single class method or a static method that takes a Boolean argument, and essentially what you're supposed to do is, if the Boolean argument is true, it should create a new creator and return that. If it's false, it should return the last instance of the class that was created. And so the, one of the reasons we're talking about this is I saw some ways to do this on the forum that um, I found concerning. So let's look at this, and again, I, I don't, I'm not going to pick on anybody, but I want to, I want to post one solution. All right. So, and, and this, this was not an uncommon way to solve this problem. Maybe it's your code, maybe it's somebody else's code. Um, all right, so what am I doing here? I have, I've created my class, I asked you to make it final, so there's, there's a final keyword there, I, it's not allowed to be extended. I have a reference variable called creator that's a static reference variable, and that I need. That stores a reference to the last created object. What is the initial value of this instance, this static variable, this class variable? It's an object reference, so if I don't initialize it, what's its initial value? No. So this is kind of equivalent, and if I wanted to be more explicit about this, I could set it equal to null. But those, those two statements are equivalent, okay? I have an empty constructor, which I, which I actually don't need. I'll get rid of this. Uh, remember, if you don't provide a constructor, you get that empty constructor by default. So I don't need to, pr to explicitly provide a constructor for the object. Um, all right, so now I have my new or old method. It's a static method. It takes a Boolean as an argument. Um, and, and again, this was a common approach to solving this problem where what I've done is I've added another variable to my class that I use to identify whether or not it's the first time that the method was called. So if it's the first time, if I've never been called before, I set it to true and I return null. Otherwise, I look at the flag that's being passed to the uh, method, and if the flag is true, I create a new creator, I save the reference to it um, in that static reference variable that, that I created, um, I mark that this was, that I was called, and I return a reference to the new creator. Otherwise, I just return the old creator. Okay? So this works. This is, this was a correct solution. But it's got some pieces on it that are unnecessary. So who can give me a suggestion about how to clean this up a little bit? Yeah. Oh, okay, good question. All right, so, so this is an interesting point. So there's a claim that I don't need to set was called to true in my conditionals at the bottom, so on line 11 and line 14. Is that right? Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah. In, yeah, in the back. OK. 
Okay. Other suggestions? Yeah. Okay, so here's another way to, to think about this. The, the function of this Boolean is to determine whether or not this method's been called before. But how can I determine that? What's another way to determine that? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so my creator variable is initialized to null. And until I set it to something, it will remain null. And so, this, this variable right here was essentially only serving the function of determining whether or not creator is null or not. And I don't need to do that because I can check directly to see if it's null. All right, so, so let's look at the, let's go back and look at the problem description. It says, if the argument is two, it should, it should essentially create a new creator. If its argument is false, it should return the last creator. And if it's never called before, you should be, you should return null, okay? So let's, let's try, let's try doing this. This is the, I'm gonna break the indentation as well. All right, is new or old. So if this Boolean is true, I'm, asked, I'm being asked to create a new creator object. This work. Yeah, sure. Does it actually call it with two at it the first time you look at the creator? Ah, okay. So this is a this is a good this is a good point, right? So the the question says if the argument is true, it should return a new creator instance. If the argument is false, it should return the last creator created by new or old. All right, so there's, so there's this, um, there's some ambiguity in the specification here, isn't there? Right? So the, so the question becomes, if new or old has never been called before, you should return null, but how does that interact with the statement about the argument being true? So what this says is, if the argument is true, it should return a reference to a new creator. But it also says it's never been called before, it should to return a reference to, uh, it should return null. So how do you square those two things together? Any ideas? So you don't. It's a bad specification. It's one of the reasons we're talking about this question. So this is unclear, right? What should you do? So it turns out that the test suite actually expects you to sort of do this, these things in order. So if it's true, I should always return a new creator, regardless of whether or not it's the first time it's called. If it's false, then I return the last creator that I created. If I've never been called before and the argument is false, then I return no. Does that make sense? So in this case, this solution works. Now the previous solution that I showed you will also work, and in many ways it's a representation of the other interpretation of this specification, right? Which is, you know, that, that last clause is true both if create is true and create is false. Does this make sense? So I'm not gonna claim that this was intentional. I'm not that clever. But if we give you problems like this, you know, please try to make sure that you, you clarify exactly what you need to do, right? Because this was a problem where you could interpret the specification either way. Essentially, there's a truth table there with two values for 
uh, whether or not it's been called before and what the argument to the function is. And, you know, depending on how those two intersect, you do one thing or the other, right? So again, so this is a, let me go back to the original solution that I was, that I was picking on, which is not fair because it's a correct interpretation of a reading of the specification where I always return null if I've never been called before, regardless of what the argument to the function is. Questions about this before we go on? So why is this important, right? So this is an example of, you know, ambiguity in a specification. And it's a good time to talk about this because we're talking about interfaces. And interfaces are the place where this type of ambiguity will get you into a lot of trouble, right? So if you wrote this, you know, it's like both of those implementations that I showed you, they're different. They actually behave differently. But they're both, I would argue, one variant of a correct reading of the specification, right? So this is, this is a, you know, a, a pan to documentation. Okay. So I, I also, so this is, the, this day is gonna be a little bit of a grab bag. I wanna go back and talk about references because I used this slide several times about how we were gonna talk about Java internals and then we never talked about Java internals, so I feel bad about that. So I didn't use that slide again because I thought it was a little repetitive. Um, but I wanna come back and, and do a little bit of this because I want you to understand one of the ways that references in Java are powerful. So references, you know, we talked about how references, um, so when, when you work with objects in Java, you're working with a reference to an object. You can pass that reference to a function, at which point the function now has a copy of the reference, so it can access the same object. You can make copies of the reference. Um, and so at that point you have multiple references to that object. But why is this such an important idea, and, and why are references, this is also on some level what distinguishes references from pointers, uh, which is a concept that you'll learn about when you take courses that teach C or C++. So references have to be translated. So when you, you know, when I take a phone number and I call it, I punch it into my phone, what the phone company is doing is it's translating that reference. So it takes that number that I gave it, which is a reference, and it essentially goes through a process where it looks up like what device on my network is supposed to ring when I call this number. And so some of you may have gone through the process where you had an old phone and you go in and you get a new phone. And the reason that you can keep the same phone number is that the phone number is just a reference. And so what the phone company does internally is it says, okay, I'm gonna adjust how I translate that reference, how I dereference this particular piece of information, and I'm not going to have it ring your old phone anymore. I'm gonna have it ring your new phone. So this is the same thing that happens when you go to a URL. So every time you go to google.com, there's a process where that reference is being translated into another identifier. And sometimes, actually, you can go to google.com multiple times in the same browser and maybe even see that that reference is translated differently. Right? You know, Google controls the, so at some point, when you go to a web page, you're communicating with an actual physical machine. But which machine you communicate with can change, even if you use the same reference. So again, so I can, I can move things, right? I can move phones from one number to another. I can also block stuff. So the phone company, if you don't pay your bill, the phone company will say, I'm not going to translate this reference anymore. When someone calls you, I'm gonna give them some sort of message that says this phone number is no longer in service or this person is a bad person and hasn't paid their bill or whatever the message says. I don't know what it says, right? So I have control of this because I control the reference, right? In Java, and in a number of other languages, we also do something else with references, which is we use them to manage and control the memory usage of your program. And this is, again, not something that we're gonna get into in great detail, but it's really interesting and fun. So you may have noticed something, which is that Java has no delete keyword. So I have new. What does new do? New creates a new object. And in order to store the state that that object has, I have to get some memory. 
somewhere. So some little chunk of one of those sticks of memory that you stuck into your machine or that someone else stuck into your machine is now devoted to storing the, the data inside of that object, the state. But what happens to those objects? I mean, I, I have new, which creates a new object, and then I do some stuff with it, but shouldn't, at some point, shouldn't I tell Java that I'm done with the object, that I'm finished, I don't need it anymore? If I don't do that, what's going to happen? Say I have like a, a program like IntelliJ, it's written in, written in Java, and you've been using it for like a couple of days because you're like, you know, really working hard on one of the MPs, and as you go along, it's always calling new to create new objects. Every time you open a new file in the editor window, there's probably a bunch of objects that get created, whatever. So over time, what would happen? I keep, you know, you keep saying I need a new object, so Java goes and finds some memory somewhere. After a while, what's gonna happen? Maybe this has happened to you on your own machine, experientially. If I never put that memory away, yeah. Yeah, you only have a certain amount of memory. You have a lot of memory in your machines today, just an enormous amount, but it's still limited. It's not infinite. So at some point, you may have noticed this, like, you know, if you open up, like, 70 browser tabs, or 100 browser tabs, or 1,000 browser tabs, right? You know, or you have, a, like, you have a machine that maybe has some, it's like a lightweight, you know, um, netbook type thing or something, and you open up a bunch of programs, it starts to slow down a little bit. So you only have a certain amount of memory, and if I keep just using it for new stuff, and I never delete anything, then eventually I'm gonna run out. And things are gonna start to get slow. Things are gonna start to get bad. This is something you will learn much more about when you take later classes. One of the things that Java was a pioneer at, again, Java's an old language, but one of the things that it did that was relatively new for a big, widely used commercial language is something called garbage collection. And that's pretty much what it sounds like. From time to time, as your program keeps running, there are objects that you're not using anymore, and Java will automatically reclaim the memory that they're consuming. So that ensures that the memory usage of your application doesn't just increase towards infinity as time goes on. How do we do this? So, for example, this is a program that I can run in Java, okay? What does this program do? I could run this program in Java, and I could leave it running, and I could go away for the weekend, and I could come back, and it would still be running. What does it do? It's kind of a silly little program. So what do I have on line two? This is a good, good for loop syntax uh, review. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so this is an infinite loop, but it has a counter. So there's no condition. Remember, all three parts of a for loop are optional. So what, what does this for loop do? It starts counting at zero, and it counts up towards infinity. It'll never stop. It's just gonna keep going. What do I do inside the loop? Yeah. So what happens on line three? What do I see on line three? I see a keyword on line three. What does line three do? The question is, can I declare this inside the loop? And of course I can, right? So on line three, I create a new string reference variable called s, and I initialize it to refer to a new string. And so here I'm creating a new string. There is memory that's being consumed on your machine every time this loop runs. There's a little bit of memory that I'm using to store a string, and that string happens to be initialized to what the loop counter variable is, but that's not important. So every time the loop runs, I create another string. 
And then the first time, so this is important, the first time I save a reference to that string outside the loop. So I created a reference on line one. The first time I come through the loop, I copy the reference to the new string I just created to this string variable called save. So every time I go through the loop, I'm creating a new string. So what should happen to this program? A string consumes some amount of memory. It's not a huge amount, but it's non-zero. So if I run this for a while, what should happen? What should happen to the memory consumed? Yeah. It should fill up, yeah. At some point I should, you know, if I run it 10 times, I should consume some amount of memory, and then if I run it 100 times, I should consume 10 times that amount of memory. If I run it 1,000 times, I should consume 1,000 times the initial amount of memory. So this should just keep consuming memory, you know, until your computer crashes. At some point, all the memory on your computer is used, and this program should stop. But I could run this, again, for weeks. You could run this program on, in Java, and you could leave it running for a decade. It will never crash. Why? So this is a place where Java's reference system comes into play. So when you create a reference variable in Java, Java tracks what that reference variable refers to. And here's the rule of thumb that it uses to identify garbage. So an object is garbage if there are no references to it anymore. So if some part of your program has a reference to an object, Java says, that object must still be useful. Keep it. I can't get rid of it yet. If no part of your program has a reference to an object, it's garbage. And the important thing here is that because of how Java works, you will never be able to access that object again. Once you lose all the references to an object, it might as well not exist. So again, if I give out, you know, 10 copies of my phone number, and you guys lost all of them, if no one in the world knew my phone number, imagine that. I don't get very many phone calls, so I don't really care, right? But imagine if no one in the world knew my email address, right? I would never get any email. I might as well not exist at that point. You don't have an email address, right? I'm not a real person. Um, when, when, uh, <laughs> anyway, I'll tell that story some other time. Um, yeah, so if, if you lose all the copies of my phone number, if no one in the world knows what my phone number is, I might as well not have a phone. It will never ring. And so I can just toss it. You know, it's, it's not useful. So once Java identifies that there are no references left to an object, it can delete, it knows it can delete that memory. And so here's what this looks like over time. Here's my reference counting example. This is after one iteration of this loop. So when I finish the first iteration of the loop, I have two references to this string that I created that stores the string zero. Because I saved one, I set save equal to that first reference. Now, if I run it again, Here's what it looks after two inside the second iteration. So inside the second iteration, save is still referring to that first string, but this reference variable s inside the loop refers to this new string with a value of one. So this is at the end of the second iteration of the loop. What do things look like at the end of the third iteration? So at this point, if Java said, is there any garbage in the system, the answer is no because both of my strings still have a reference to them, so I can't get rid of them. However, once I run this loop one more time, now look what things look like. So now I still have a reference to that first string I created the first time through the loop. I have a reference to the string I just created, that third call to new, but I have no reference to the second call to new. And if I run it again, this keeps happening. So inside the loop, I keep creating new objects, saving that reference variable to this local variable that's inside the loop, and then immediately forgetting about them. And this may seem dumb, but there are a lot of loops like this that you're gonna write, where you use a variable internally, you do some work with it, and then you're done with it. Next time the loop uh, restarts, you create a new one. So eventually, and this doesn't happen all the time, but eventually Java does something called garbage collection. It runs a, 
a, an internal process called a garbage collector. And the garbage collector goes through your program. And it looks for any objects where there are no references to them. So again, at this point in the program, if I wanted to do something to that second string I created, the string that had value one, or if I wanted to do something to the third string I created, the string that had value two, there is no way I can do it because I don't have a reference to it. They're gone. They might as well not exist. And when the garbage collector runs, after the garbage collector runs, they won't exist anymore. Because what Java's gonna do is it's gonna say, aha, you are done with these objects. I know that because there are no more references to them. And therefore, goodbye. So I'm going to free these objects, and now whatever memory they were consuming can now be reused for something else. It's no longer needed to store this data, and so I'm gonna free it, and I'm gonna make it available to the program to, as it continues to run. Questions about this? No, yeah, so great question. Okay, so, so the question was, in Java, can I access something by using its numeric location? So you're gonna take, so, okay, let me just rant about this for a minute. So you're gonna take some courses in our program that are gonna force you to not use this beautiful feature of programming languages that we invented like 30 years ago, all right? The fact is, unless you are doing extreme, so there, there are languages that don't do this for you. They force you, as the programmer, to tell them, I need some memory, and then when I'm done with it, I'm done with this memory. And the fact is, you, the programmer, are terrible at this. You're terrible at it. One of the things you do is that you forget to get memory for something, and then you try to use something that's null. So Java actually doesn't help with that. But one of the other things you do is you think you're done with something, and you tell the program, I'm finished with this memory, and then later you try to use it again. And at that point, it's different. It's been used for something else. And so these types of problems with memory management are the source for like lots and lots of bugs in computer systems. And that's why we stopped using languages that force you to do that, except in some of our courses. No, I'm, I'm being a little facetious. There are reasons to do this sometimes. There are tiny little performance improvements that you can get. But in most cases, if you use Python, if you use Java, JavaScript, Go, uh, Rust has its own way of doing this, it's different, but it still forces you to think about it. Um, you don't have to think about memory management anymore because there's a part of the program that does it for you. So what does this mean? So in Java, what this means is that there is some memory somewhere in your program that stores string three. And in other languages, you can get something called a pointer. You can get a numeric reference to it. That's the memory address where this lives. Java does not allow you to do this. And the reason is this. By f every time you use a reference variable in Java, it's doing this translation automatically for you. And that allows me to make sure that, um, it, I mean, in Java, it basically allows you to track whether or not things are in use, right? If I gave you access to where these things were in memory, there's two problems. The first problem is you might try to, I, it doesn't allow me to move things around. So one of the other things that Java does as your program is running is that it will move objects from place to place in memory to try to free up additional space. Again, take 241 and you will find out more about this than you wanted to know. If I give you the address where it is in memory, I can't do that anymore. The second thing is that if I give you the address of where something is in memory, you can still get to it even after the reference is no longer there. And so it, it breaks the whole reference uh, system. So the answer is no. It's a great question, something that'll make more sense to you once you take later classes. Okay, so again, this is, you know, hopefully this, you know, explains a little bit about what Java does. And again, this is one of the features that when Java introduced it was incredibly important. So when I took intro programming years and years ago uh, as, a, as a sophomore in college, I remember, you know, fighting through my first course, it was in C, and there were all these segmentation faults, and like a lot of times things didn't work, and it was usually because of problems with memory management. And then I took the second course in the series, and they taught us Java, they actually taught us three languages, but they taught us Java, 
And I still remember, I'm, you know, Java's not my favorite language, but I still remember in that class, it was the first time that I wrote a program, it was a simple program, and it worked the first time I ran it. That had never happened to me before. Um, and one of the reasons that Java, uh, is easier to use than some of these other languages is because it does do this for you. So this is something that if you use Python, if you use JavaScript, if you use a bunch of languages now, Ruby, you know, pretty much any modern language does not force you to manage memory. It does this type of garbage collection for you. Languages do it in a lot of different ways, but they all do it. And that makes programming much, much, much easier. Okay. So now I'm really done talking about references. I apologize for that sort of wandering pericope of content. Yeah. Can you ask the question again? Yeah, so, th so the question is, does Java block translation of references? And the answer is no. Um, so this is not a feature that Java uses with references to memory management, but it is a feature that I can use with references in general, right? So that's one of the things that I can do with a reference. Java doesn't do this um, with objects. It just counts, right? The, the approach that Java uses to garbage collection relies on something that's called reference counting. So I need to know how many references there are to a particular object. Does that answer the question? So what does it mean to block translation? So, so in certain, you know, so in certain computer systems, so again, um, Java references to objects are not the right example to use here, but whenever you go to a website, there's a process of translating that domain name to a machine address. If that website stops paying its bills, the company that runs the domain name system can essentially stop translating, right? So if Google, goes out of business, that at some point when you go to google.com, it won't work. You'll try to translate, so you're taking a name of a website and trying to translate it, and the organization that, the, the, the services that provide that translation will stop working. All right, good question. All right, so we're doing great on time, except for the fact that I had a bunch of other stuff to cover. We will come back and do this on Friday. Let me, get through a couple of announcements. So MP4 is out. Please get started on it this week. Um, you know, we have, you know, you, if you talk to the CAs, um, MP4 is, you know, we, we, we do try to control difficulty level. Um, we are aware of the fact that you're working in Android for the first time. The rest of MP4 is easier um, as a result of that. So we understand that there's some onboarding process that you're going through to get comfortable with Android development, using Android Studio, using the emulator, stuff like that. And so we've cut back pieces of MP4 to give you more time to do that over the next couple weeks. I'm holding office hours today. Uh, please come by. I'll probably do this again tomorrow. Please come by if you want to talk about how you're doing in the class. If there's anyone else here who is doing these DGS instructor interviews, um, I'm sort of getting tired of doing them. Um, and so I will do another round at 11. So if you have one to do, come at 11. Um, and we'll, we can do it in a group. I've done them that way. Um, and at that point, I'm just not gonna tell you any stories about myself anymore, ever. Um, and if you have comments you wanna make about the class, the link's up to the anonymous feedback form. Good luck getting started on MP4. I will see you guys on 